left our guest just as she was finishing up her Diageo Global World Class Competition experience. For those of you who missed part one, go back to the previous episode and start there. Now is the time to delve into part two of our interview with Lauren Moat and discover where she landed when she brought food, wine, and work together. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time by everyone in this industry. Now that you know a little bit more about Lauren, it's time to find out how everything she learned along the way led her to launch her award-winning, internationally renowned bitters company, Bittered Sling, and what being the first Diageo world-class global cocktailian really means. Before we begin, you can find links on how to donate to some of your favorite bars or have cocktails delivered right to your door during this rough time on the homepage of my website, alushlifemanual.com. Now, let's commence with part two. Now, we talked a little bit about now world class. Let's go back to, of course, one of your babies, I guess, um, Bitter Sling, your, your Bitter's company. Ooh, this one right of here? Of course, yeah. yes. <laughs> Um, of course, that is totally bringing together your love of food and um, and drink. So you, I want you to explain it. Tell me how how it was born. Yeah, it's uh, so it's it's kind of a cool process because when I realized that I probably was not going to work in a kitchen, but I would surround myself with with really great chefs and great professionals in the industry. Um, we, you know, a, a part of running the best beverage program in a great restaurant is having the best ingredients to work with. And in Vancouver at the time, because I, I moved from Trent, uh, some, uh, Toronto to Vancouver in 2007. And at the time, Vancouver was the national hotspot for sort of the farm to table movement, um, started by you know anyone from John Bishop to a host of other amazing chefs. And so it was really like in its prime at the moment. And so every chef that you would end up meeting in Vancouver was connected in some way to nature and connected to where their food was coming from and where the ingredients were coming from in a way that I'd never experienced before. And it it was the first time I'd seen on a menu where farms were highlighted. Uh, So, you know, this Mm -hmm. pork, it's not just pork chop, it's sloping hills, farm pork chop, you know, so it was the way of bringing farmers and purveyors and the the people that are part of the supply chain in food into the forefront. But we weren't really doing the same thing in the beverage world. And so in Vancouver, there there were a handful of bartenders that were really understood the language and the concept of culinary in the same way that a chef did and working together to build those relationships and those concepts together was uh, I think paramount um, for me at the time and paramount for a lot of uh, guests and diners that would come in and, and eat and drink at our establishments. So we, we didn't have the same ingredients to make classic cocktails as uh, our neighbors to the South and in the U S they had, they had everything and they had everything for half the price. Um, so when it came to, you know, liqueurs and vermouths and, and some of the base material uh, they had everything they could make very affordable cocktails. Anything that we could get in Canada, we would pay almost double the price because of duties and taxes. And it's so and crazy. It sounds so boards. crazy to me. Yeah, that yeah. you could that you could you know go to Zigzag uh, Cafe where Murray Stenson and Eric Hennigan were were bartending in Seattle, and you could have uh, a couple hours like, away. Yeah, and you could have a Negroni using like basic ingredients like, you know, gin and Campari, whatever you had that, that flavor profile. But then with any vermouth that you wanted, we were like, oh, we have Cinzano in Canada. We have Martini Rosso in Canada. Like there wasn't anything else. Right. But you, And you go there and you have your pick of like, you know, 15, 20, 25 different things to change your very simple drink, your three ingredient drink for like eight bucks. Yeah. <laughs> eight bucks Canadian. That's like with you know, with, uh, with the conversion. And then in Canada, we had, you know, you can have the same thing made with, you know, gin X Campari and, you know, stock vermouth or whatever, and it would be $14 Canadian, you know, so it was just it was a really hard and also really informed time to bartend uh, in Canada. And of course, in Toronto, 
uh, a lot of what I was doing at Le Select was uh, a good example of what the rest of the city was doing as well. We had like a great aperitif culture in restaurants. So people would come in, they'd have a beer, they'd have like a chilled lile, they'd have a gin and tonic. Um, and then maybe they'd have a brandy at dessert or a specialty coffee. Like when was the last time you had a specialty coffee other than Irish coffee? So it was still focused on sort of that sort of style of beverage culture. Whereas in Vancouver, it was the bartenders are doing exactly what the chefs are doing. So I know this is a really long answer to your question, but I think it's important to set the context of what we we're going through. And when we talk about bitters, okay, so we couldn't get vermouth. We couldn't get certain liqueurs. We, I, I remember when maraschino liqueur finally became available in British Columbia. You could only buy it in a six pack. It was $27 a bottle Canadian for 500 mils. And you could only buy the six pack and it would take two weeks to come in because it was a spec product. So if we wanted to make a Martinez or if we wanted to make anything that required maraschino liqueur, like Brooklyn, whatever, we had to order in this case of stuff that we would use by the quarter ounce, <laughs> and you weren't allowed to, to break the case and share it with another licensee or another restaurant. So it was really challenging. So that is part of why bartenders in Vancouver started making all of their own products is because, you know, if, if Cointreau is too expensive to buy, do we have the resources to like peel oranges and get some make your own, own base right. spirit and make our own curacao? It's not going to have like that fundamental terroir character as Cointreau will have from Loire Valley, but at least we can make something that helps us make a sidecar or helps us, you know, do something. Right. And that's a really broad example, but we went through that with every category, you know, even with, with gins, we only had certain amount available. We had a certain number of like rums available or tequila or whatever mezcal. We didn't have any, you know, we didn't have any in Canada for the longest time. Um, that wasn't that long ago, you know, that was 13 years ago. So, mm -hmm. um, so bitters became one of the things that we focused on because if, we, if you know, if I look at the quintessential ingredients that really define what a cocktail is, if we look at, you know, the 1806 script from May 13th, and we talk about World Cocktail Day, and we talk about the first time the cocktail appeared in print, it was vulgarly described as a bittered sling, a combination of bitter spirits, water and sugar. And at the time, there were only a few people that knew that that text was available that was before the times of like, you know, David Wondrich and before right. the times of everyone sort of uh, pushing all that information out there and making it readily available for everyone. And so if bitters was such an important and critical part of making balanced drinks, then why on earth do we only have access to Agostura? We are handicapped by our inability to have orange bitters, to have grapefruit bitters, to have, you know, um, Creole bitters, like anything like a Peychaud. We didn't have anything. Yeah. Uh, so at the time, uh, I took my vast love and understanding of the food world um, and started to create like some of the early prototypes of, of doing like bitters and vermouths from scratch and understanding that, see, the wine world comes in. So wine is like the base for vermouths. So we, we were making a lot of stuff um, in 2008, 2009. Um, and I think that was just more of the like concept of the bar that I was working at. It started as a wine and cheese joint. And I said, why not turn it into this cocktail bar that specializes in X, Y, Z. And, and that was really cool. And it got us, uh, you know, a lot of uh, publicity and a lot of notoriety because we were doing something across Canada that hadn't existed yet. And that, and that was really, really cool. And it helped to, I guess, set the stage of what we could do with it from there. But the, I guess the thing that really changed everything was in 2010, that's when I met Jonathan. And Jonathan is to the culinary world what I guess I am to the beverage world. I don't think about things in the context of, you know, stay within this, you know, square parameter. Jonathan is so focused on local food and flavor and doing really dynamic and innovative ways of showcasing the, the profile of Canadian cuisine. And he had worked in these incredible ingredient driven locations like the Souk Harbor house uh, where they only cooked from the land and they rewrote the menu every day. They could only, they could, they could use olive oil and a couple of other foreign products, but everything else had to come from exactly the land that they were on, on this garden. Um, the second place that he worked at that was really interesting was called uh, 
um, King Pacific Lodge, where it was this floating barge hotel and restaurant that was way up the coast in the Haida Gwaii, where he was taking film crews out during low tide to harvest seaweed. So we think about seaweed as like a nori covering on the outside of our roll, you know, our sushi roll. Right. But he was like with kelp and dulci and, you know, all kinds. He identified like 13 different types of edible seaweed. And that went into his, you know, daily menus that they were also writing, you know, on a day-to-day basis. So his, you know, his, his palate and his understanding of how to uh, create storytelling with ingredients and how to bring it together for a chef's palate to be innovative rather than making something like vanilla extract. Why don't we take this opportunity to make something even greater? We connected on like a serious intellectual level. Um, He was talking about flavor and he was happy. That's the other thing too. Like sometimes chefs are like within the intensity of their creativity lies the underpinning of their emotional problems, you know, and, and <laughs> some bartenders have that too. And so for me, it was like, okay, uh, I'm really excited about these flavors, but I also don't know what to do when you start crying. Like, what do I do? Um, so Jonathan was, Jonathan was in, incredibly, you know, well adjusted, I, I suppose, to the, to the trials and tribulations of working in the industry. And, Just and well I adjusted. Too. Yeah, well, right, just well adjusted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and then and then I met all of his friends, and they were all the same. I'm like, where have you people been all my life? <laughs> They're all like these really, really happy and like brilliant chefs. And I thought, so you're not all angry and throwing right. plates at walls and, and scream at each other yeah, in the back, screaming at each other, and like total. Oh, sorry, dumping things on the floor. Um, but uh, so Jonathan, when when Jonathan and I started dating. Um, it was right. It was the day after he came in with another chef to the bar I was running at the time called the refinery. And he wanted like the full experience. He had read an article. It was the covenant of the cook that you referenced earlier. He read the covenant of the cook and some science experiment that I had uh, written and publicized about using a nitrous oxide powered, like pressure handheld, like it's called a my pressy. And it was used for like aluminute espresso shots without heat. So I, so I was using this thing that was uh, given to me by a friend who was doing like coffee reviews. And he's like, do you want to do something with this and alcohol and see what happens? And I said, yeah, because traditionally, if you try and do anything with coffee, it's always quite bitter with alcohol. So because the heat's involved. So how do we how do we adjust that? Uh, so I wrote this like total lab report and he found it and he thought, oh, my God, this person is just like me. So they came into the refinery. They had this this full breakdown experience of like the vermouths, the aromatized wines, the bitters, the tinctures, the even just the way we talked about food and beverage together was uh, was in, intrinsically connected to the science and the flavor rather than, oh, we just did it because, you know, no one else was doing it. He just he just understood things in a different way. And so we started dating right away because we realized that we were like the same person. Um He's also older than I am. He's eight years older, which means he has traveled and seen other parts of the world and other cultures that I hadn't even experienced yet beyond cookbooks. Um, So he was able to add like a real life scenario and situation to a lot of the things that we were talking about. So if we were to create La Marrakesh bitters, well, this is inspired by the the food profile and the flavor profile of Morocco and the Levant. And I say, well, what's the Levant region all about? Like, is it Middle East? Is it Lebanon? Is it Israel? Is it Morocco? And he's like, well, here are the differences region by region with cuisine. So naturally, the differences region by region by flavor profile for beverage, which sometimes didn't even include alcohol. You know, that was sort of where things started to come together, because I had studied stats and geopolitical and geography and culture, and, you know, how people were eating and drinking but he had like the the research component to bring to the table of, and this is what they actually eat. Right. This is and what this it's is like when you really go there. Right? Yeah, exactly. And so that that was that was really cool. And we thought, well, we're going to open this boutique catering and events company first called Kale and Nori, representative of the land and sea, because he was obsessed with the ocean and I'm obsessed with the land. And uh, 
we, we did these, these themed events that were so cool and really, I, I felt like really ahead of, ahead of their time actually, uh, in the programs that we did, we had an event called Bittered Sling Bistro and also uh, cocktail kitchen, which were all highlighting the bartender's ability to work with the chef to build a food and beverage occasion where the flavors would match together and the guest would fill out a scorecard. So it would have a theme, it would have a spirit category, and then it would have the chef and bartender working together to create a three course, you know, very, very casual tasting menu inspired by, you know, certain, you know, time and place. And we, I I think over like a four year period in our pop-up restaurant, because that's what it was, uh, we had about, um, I think Jonathan had several guest chefs, but it was really about him cooking to like the global uh, global palate in in different ways uh, to exemplify his travels and his studies. And I was bringing in, you know, bartenders from all over British Columbia to participate in this. I think in the end, we had like over, you know, 100 bartenders participate in the program. And it was I, I felt like it was so it was so ahead of its time in that in that moment. You know, it was was very, very cool. And then when we thought that it was getting uh, a little bit too mainstream, then we closed it. You know, but bitters was bitters was the thing that was like the highlight of everything. It's the reason why it's called bittered sling is because it is the quintessential part of making a cocktail go. Bittered sling has has always been a really important part of how we see flavors. If we could make an indefinite shelf life product that could be administered through dashes and drops that could be, you know, activated through, uh, you know, the spice cabinet without having to overthink what to do with that, you know, bucket of fenugreek you have in the cupboard. But instead, if the flavor profile you're cooking to is actually Morocco, then why don't we make something that connects the food and beverage world together in the beverage world? It does what bitters are supposed to do, which is dry out the cocktail, blend flavors together, just be that foil. And then in the food world, it's that little something that you can add that's dynamic and complex in itself and does what we need those finishing products to do. You finish with a bit of vinegar, you finish with a bit of olive oil, you finish with a bit of spice. Like what is that? So that, that was basically why we started Bittered Sling. And to this day, I mean, we don't add sugar or coloring to any of our bitters because they are the pure expression of that spice profile and that culture in a bottle. And um, 10 years later, I mean, I, of course I'm biased. I think we make, you know, the best bitters in the world, but so, um, how did you know which one to start with? Like what flavor were you going to do? What were going to be the flavors to begin with? Just, you know, for example, one or two of the first ones, how did you come to it? To be honest, um, the ones that we started with, uh, to commercialize were the ones that Jonathan, Jonathan and I felt the most connected to. So for Jonathan, he felt very connected to me and his love of Latin American culture and his love of Mexico. Um, And he wanted to create a flavor profile that celebrated like this very eccentric way that flavors come together to birth one of the great, you know, culinary flavors of all time, which is the terroir of Mexico. And he wanted to, to try and pick flavors that also represented my very spicy and crazy personality. So, so it's very created, romantic. I know it's very romantic, but I mean, it's like, it's why it's why it's called moon dog. Like moon dog, <laughs> moon dog is my pet name. And it's like, it's also the name of a, of a Daniel Lanois song. Um, and Daniel Lanois is one of the great uh, music producers, singers, uh, musicians of, of our time uh, from Quebec. And he's uh you know, he wrote a song about creativity, about a person called Moondog, who was like a blend of so many incredible properties and like sort of unsung moments and disciplines and hobbies that came together to create something brilliant. And so that was Jonathan's way of trying to celebrate that in a bottle. He's he's very, very romantic and he's very that. emotionally connected. He's like, He's an old soul, you know, he, he's, he always is trying to find the human way to bring something to life, which I think is very, very cool. And then the one that I chose to exemplify was the, was the plum and root beer, because like the plum and root beer reminded me of being a kid. It reminded me of the genre of films that I loved from like the 50s, 60s and 70s. 
um, era pieces of like this amazing time that was right after World War II, where I was trying to like live vicariously through my grandparents. I'm like, why do you entertain like this? Like how, how do you always know what to do? You always know when to offer someone a drink, when to barbecue, when to sit around and play cards. Like you seem to know the right moments to do these things. So there's something about that era from like 1950 to 1975 that I'll never be able to live through um, because I was born in the eighties, but there are parts of that, like the ice cream socials and the music and like the, the way people came together. So it's, it's the ice cream social, you know, and root beer is, um, is a quintessential part of growing up in North America. It is to us what dandelion and burdock is uh, to you in the United Kingdom. Um, it's, uh, it's also like the, the very regionally specific cola from the US, you know. Um, well, I have to admit that those combinations remind me of something. I, I know you didn't grow up um, eating bad food, but my, I didn't either. But one of the things that I always loved as junk food was a Dr. Pepper. And oh, yeah. to me, that is like plum and root beer kind of together. Yes. So yes. it's like, I can't wait to try that. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I hope I mean, she doesn't take this the wrong no. way, I was thinking. But, no, no, no. oh, my God, it sounds like Dr. Pepper to me, which is one of my favorite flavors on earth. So, and I'm so happy you said that because uh, there are, if I could line up my favorite soda pops of all time, it would be Coca-Cola, not Pepsi, but Coca-Cola, root beer, um, Me too. Cream soda, Dr. Pepper, Cherry Coke. Black I cherry. love Cherry Coke. Me too. But, but all of those, like the, the flavor profiles are really similar. Like there's some distinctive differences. But what a lot of people don't realize about the, I guess, the, the mass production of those sodas now is that they, there are elements of it that sort of take us back to a time and place like in, like in another country, but it's all, all bit lost now. This is, this is part of like a, you know, flavor profiles that are connected really to North America and nowhere else. So we thought we would take like the love of root beer and the love of connecting back to your childhood mm -hmm. and make it about where those spices are coming from. So we're very forthcoming with how we make plum and root beer. The plums are used to add subtle sweetness and, um, and texture to an otherwise very, very bitter bitters because everything that's in here comes from like, it comes from Asia, like sarsaparilla is coming from Asia and sarsaparilla and sassafras are what make that quintessential flavor of root beer but there's also wintergreen and there's spearmint and there's teas and there's the bitter barks and roots. Like there's so many things that go into making root beer, something that is usable without sugar. Right. And that's what this is. And so when you end up using this with um, like with bourbon or with rum or even by itself, you dump it on ice cream, you pair it with like green cardamom, like whatever it is. Somehow, if you are a fan of root beer, this bitters will work for everything because it's, it, it's, yeah, it's just, it's just really interesting. But um, yeah, it's uh, those were the first two. And after that, you know, we'd see the, the beginning of uh, orange and juniper and then grapefruit and hops, like adding the rest of the repertoire that would be really important flavor profiles to make proper uh, classic drinks. If you didn't have access to the standard ingredients, or if you wanted to take the classic recipes and adjust them to create new volumes, you know, or to create new contemporary twists or whatever that might be. Um, you know, the, uh, the Kensington aromatic bitters were, you know, the big sort of aromatic bitters that, that we created in, in 2012, that would be the optional item to use wherever aromatic bitters is called for and has a very different flavor profile. It has less to do with the flavor profile of the West Indies and the northern part of uh, of South America, and more to do with the origin story of where the the spices come from, which again is from Asia. Um, we felt like you know in the studies over the years, understanding the amount of misinformation and how much people don't know about where spices and botanicals come from. We thought these were really great moments and opportunities to educate, and that's also why our bitters have strange names. Like Moondog is a strange name. It's memorable, but we put Latin on it. So you know, it's Latin inspired, but you, you feel like there's, 
there's this hook to learn more. Like, why is it called Moondog? Well, it's a story of creativity. Plum and root beer. Well, what do we do about that? Well, the root beer spices are nostalgic, but they come from place X. Mm -hmm. And this is a very global flavor. You know, I, I'm just looking up on our on my back bar here. Malagasy chocolate is the celebration of Madagascar cacao and how different it is from cacao coming from anywhere else in the world. And we build a flavor profile to celebrate that. So it's um, over the last, you know, eight to 10 years has been a really amazing journey with Bittered Sling because uh, the, the flavors, while they have always remained the same, they have evolved. You know, they have evolved to go based on the way people's palates have changed and the way that people are looking at drinks, whether it's no and low or it's mm. um, standard standard proof or whatever it is, it's cooking, it's, you know, milkshake, it's iced coffee, it's whatever it is, like bittered sling is is essentially a very delicious holistic extract is really what it is. It's, you know, you can buy some of these things at like Whole Foods or like Weight Rose or any, you know, Holland and Barrett, you know, they've got these, you know, great holistic tinctures that are like, Ooh, take this, you know, with these whole botanicals and whatever, and you taste it. And it's like, but couldn't you make something delicious? Yeah. I mean, and there's, there's glycerin and there's sugar, there's all kinds of things. But I think that's, that's what makes bittered sling so special is that we come, we come at the flavor profile and we come at the product from the perspective of eating and drinking and from the perspective of don't put anything in your body that you wouldn't suggest to other people. Don't, don't eat something right. for the sake of you're hungry, but eat something because it's delicious. And it's part of that pleasurable moment. It's the same with beverage and bittered sling plays a really critical, a critical role in that. Absolutely. Now, you, I'm, I'm looking at your back bar behind you, but that back bar is no longer in Canada. It's in Amsterdam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when we started this, you were in, Am you were in, in Canada and now you're in Amsterdam. What sent you to uh, live in Europe? Well, uh, I, I have a European background in my family. So uh, I have been threatening my, my mother since I was 16 that mom, one day I'm going to move to England. She says, okay, okay. And, and I, I thought that was cool. I just, I, you know, I didn't think that we'd ever get here, to be honest. Um, I love the history of places and I've traveled all through my childhood throughout Canada, throughout the U S and I just never, I never really identified, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing about Canada. You know, when, when people from Canada you know, say they're from Canada, they always say, I'm Canadian, but my parents are from XYZ. It's, I think, one of the only countries in the world where we've got a comma, where yeah. we say we are Canadian, but my mother's family is from X and my father's family is from Y. Um, it's, it's ingrained in our, in our values as Canadians to cherish Canada as the place we live now, but to always discover the roots of where your ancestry comes from. And, and that that's always been part of our upbringing, our schooling, our parenting. Um, and so I, I knew one day, you know, we'd be able to get to Europe. And in 2017, I joined uh, Diageo as a, as a contractor uh, doing the global cocktailian role, which was a really epic and amazing time for me, especially because it was a global role. It says, okay, I'm so excited to be part of the global production of what makes world class. Cause that was, you know, world class was obviously a very pivotal, pivotal moment in my, in my career and in my life. Um, and I thought if I can be part of that, if I can be part of a bartender's life and then like increase that exponentially, um, and pay it forward with like the hospitality and the values and, you know, fine drinking some of the greatest spirits in the world, then why wouldn't I act on that? And I said, so where's this base? And they said, well, you're a contractor, so you can stay in Vancouver, but you know, you're going to be doing a lot of travel and you'll report to the team in Amsterdam, which is where we're based. I said, well, that's interesting. Okay. So I think as, as I started to travel and the travel was, was crazy. It was, uh, you know, 250, 300 days on the road, 2017, 2018 was the same. 2019 was, uh, was a little bit less. And it right, was I, really, 
I think so, I, I, I read or I heard that you went to 60 countries in, since you've yeah. had this role, this fantastic role, which I, uh, which you you discussed a little, and I didn't want to, I, I don't want to um, glean over it. So why don't you just tell, before you go on, tell us yeah. a little bit about <laughs> that role. Yeah, that definitely. You, that you've carved out for yourself. It's incredible. You're the only one. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, it, it was a really... Uh, innovative and incredible role when it when it came to the forefront. And I think it was uh, ahead of its time when it first arrived, it was really, the role was really helping to understand how all of our very, very incredible, you know, uh, luxury brands as part of the Diageo Reserve portfolio. So, you know, like Kettle One, Tanqueray Tens, a cup of rum, Johnny Walker, we have so many incredible brands. And it's, these are also the brands that bring the world-class program to life. This is our world-class portfolio. And so if our brands are intrinsically connected to fine drinking and the best bartenders in the world, then we need, you know, a role that can bring all of that together. We're, the, this isn't like an individual ambassador on one brand or a category. This has to be, you know, I am a bartender. I have one world-class I, you know, own businesses. I'm a sommelier. I have, I have so many different things going on. I understand what bartenders are going through. I understand, you know, how, how cherished our brands are and how cherished that experience is when creating a food and flavor moment with a guest. And so it's, it's an all engrossing role that is really serving at the pleasure of our guests to make sure that, that really fine drinking is really connected to education, to, you know, uh, like at home occasions where people can be making drinks at home and really celebrating with friends. How do we bring the food aspect in? How do we bring in the, the bartenders and their, their, their need to network around the world? So it was a really, a really in incredible role when it came out and it's, it's changed dramatically, you know, year by year. It's still the same role. It's the global cocktailian. It's the global ambassador for world class, and it's also, um, you know, helping to to activate and uh, and also educate across all of the brands in our portfolio and malts and Johnny Walker. Like it's, it's just so much. So I think with this very broad palette of colors to paint with. Uh, has really opened the door in a lot of ways um, to become a more aspirational moment for our reserve ambassadors around the world. There's 180 of them um, that, uh, you know, we communicate on a daily basis through one form or another. They're all connected to world class. They're all connected to building programs in, in their cities, with their bars, with their bartenders. And taking a leap of uh, faith, a very calculated leap of faith to build a role that could represent every, you know, front facing program that we have into one, into one bucket was, was really incredible because you started to see the ambassadors around the world. They weren't just wearing a Tanqueray hat anymore. They weren't just wearing a Johnny Walker hat. They were all of a sudden Diageo and world-class ambassadors that were focused on the same things that I am but on a local level. And that was something that took two or three years to build and something that I am so proud of. And I, I can't believe how incredible, like how incredible the response has been and how incredible like it is that I'm learning so much from, from the individual markets. And a lot of that, you have to travel to those places to really immerse yourself in in those moments and be with them and go to their favorite bars and teach seminars with them and understand like the bartenders and the consumers, like who's coming to these bars, like to understand the full scope of why Bangalore in India is drastically different than Bangkok and drastically different than Medellin and Colombia and drastically different than New York mm -hmm. and drastically different than Toronto. Like it's just, it, it's hard to, put into words if you haven't been there and you haven't experienced it. So it's, you know, and, and part of my job description, my very, uh, my very, you know, one or two sentences when I first started and I was trying to like wrap my head around it. I'm like, what does this mean? <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> world-class is the program that aims to develop bartenders to stand on the same respectable platform, shoulder to shoulder with the best chefs in the world. Full stop using 
the Diageo Reserve portfolio to bring the food and flavor to life, the best spirits, the affordable, the accessible, the luxury line of Diageo with great heritage and craftsmanship. Like this is how we bring this global industry to life. And I was like, this is incredible. This is, like what you, <laughs> this is like what you've been working towards your entire life. When you had that aha moment at 18, how am I going to bring food, wine, and work together? It must have been. Yeah, it, it you took know, 20 years. Took oh, 20 gosh. Years. Yeah. Such an incredible yeah. like pat on the back. Like, oh, my God, everything that I've done has really led me to this, a role that I couldn't have ever even envisioned when I was 18 that now exists today that I can do. Yeah. And I almost, and I almost like changed my tune recently in the last like four or five years when I was doing like tons of media interviews about like the, you know, where did you come from and what's the story and this and that. And, and, and over uh, the last three or four years, it's, you know, well, why was university important? And I said, well, I mean, I didn't finish, you know, I got irritated towards the end and I'm literally three credits shy of getting my degree. But I thought, like, as we're in this moment, I'm like, why am I staying to do these electives? I've, I've got what I need. And I understand, like, the piece of paper is probably important, but it wasn't to me. It was like the education was so important. I didn't think that having the degree was going to get me farther along in what I wanted to do. And I think when, you know, strike when the iron is hot, as they say, you know, and I, I'm, again, I don't think it works. It works for everybody. But for me, in that moment, there were a lot of really emotional, tear-felt moments of mom. So come back to my mom again. What do I do? I have three credits left to get, but I really feel with everything I've got right now, I feel like the energy is right. The timing is right. I want to move to Vancouver. I want to focus on wine and food and beverage. And I feel like if I stay here for another year, my window, it's over. So I can get an astronomy credit, like for what? I'm never, like, I'm never going to teach astronomy, like I, whatever. And she said, well, you do what you got to do. And I said, oh yeah. She's like, I'm not paying for your schooling anyway. I had no money. It was like, it, I was doing student loans. She's like, if you're okay spending this kind of money that you'll be paying off for quite a while and not get that piece of paper. But if you feel like you've got enough of the knowledge to just take it to the next step and now is the time, then then you should go for it. And it's it's interesting because what university taught me was how to communicate, how to write beautifully, how to speak beautifully. That's that is what education does. It's not necessarily about the thing, whether it's philosophy or political science or law or, or medicine or whatever. It it really does teach you a lot about your ability and it teaches you a lot about your breaking point, your time management. And yes, the individual disciplines are very important when you're focused on very, very professional level academic. But if you're not going to continue on after your, you know, Bachelor of Arts in Science, if you get like your just standard degree, which almost feels like today is equivalent to getting a high school diploma in a way, um, you know, what, what can you really do with that? I mean, I don't, I don't know too many people that have studied political science that have actually gone into politics. No, you know, my father always said, you go to university to learn how to think. You don't learn a trade, you learn how to think. And it just opens your mind up to learning, you know, whatever you want in the future. It just being with people and studying things that you would never get the opportunity to study again in life makes you, puts you on that path to where you might go. So your path has led you to Amsterdam. So back to Amsterdam. Yeah, and I totally agree with you on on like this this understanding of uh, post secondary education has been has been so important um, because you know being able to focus on uh, on philosophy and on globalization and on you know international relations, peace and conflict studies, like wars, conflict. This has all been important because it helps me to understand the landscape as things change. And as they change in the food and beverage industry, a lot of those studies have been incredibly relevant to helping businesses or helping teams to move forward and overcome challenges and being able to, I guess, foreshadow a little bit on how we deal with the future. And 
so I think in, you know, after working on uh, as, as a global cocktailian for, for two and a half years, I started to really think about, you know, is there a way that I could do more? Is this really one of those situations where this role might not be necessary to travel as much? Like, is it really necessary to travel this much? <laughs> there has to be something more tangible and more efficient, I suppose, with my role in particular, if, you know, I do write projects, I'm writing less projects and less programming, but traveling so much. And so if you don't have time to write the programming that you execute when you travel, then there's something that's sort of like out of balance. Um, And so I felt that um, if there was a way to convince, (laughs) convince Diageo that, you know, being closer and being more in like the face-to-face um, team oriented relationship, or even with uh, a way of just even having Zooms that were in the same time zone, like being able to just be there and be top of mind because you didn't have an eight hour time zone change or sorry, nine hours with Amsterdam. I feel like you, you have no choice, but to be part of the conversation when you're there. Um, and when you're not there because of time zones or whatever else, you, you end up I think missing out on a lot of the ways that you can really contribute. And so I pitched them the idea. I said, so what do you think if I moved to Amsterdam? They said, well, you've been talking about it for two years, so maybe you should actually do it. And I said, oh yeah, so I can just do it. And they said, well, why don't you just do it? I mean, like you're the one doing it. So like, because I'm, because I'm a contractor, I'm like, you know, I'm, I have full power to do like to do the move if I want, if it's going to be easier on me and then easier on Jonathan and then more of an adventure. And now we finally get the opportunity to move to Europe. Like, why wouldn't we do it? So it, it took us because of Brexit as well, because I have a British passport. So because of Brexit, because of uh, how work was lining up with uh, global cocktailian and how many projects I was involved in and people were so excited in the global team that what you're moving to Amsterdam, like, this is amazing. You're going to be involved in this, 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 this. And I thought, this is not the conversation that we would have normally have had. And this is amazing. So it just felt right time and place. Um, We, again, another leap of faith. Um, My mother, the right time and place. She's like, it's meant to be, it'll happen. And everything just started to really line up. And all the projects that I was, um, that I was working on helping to curate and also like participating in were just epic. And I thought, you got to go now, have to go now. And so that's how we got here. And we, we moved here four months ago. I feel like, realistically from 16. So it's been 22 years in the making, but it's also really been about two years in the making of, wow, this could be something that we actually do. And, you know, for people moving around Europe, it's not a big deal. They're like, oh, you moved to Amsterdam, you moved to Madrid, you moved wherever. But like you move from Vancouver. I mean, that's the other side of the planet. Like it's a different ocean, you know, it's, it's very far. So it's, uh, that was a big leap of faith. And in thinking that everything would just line up. And when we got here, um, it didn't disappoint. I felt like we hit the ground running and uh, it's, you know, obviously we're, we're in challenging times right now, but I feel like we are, we are in a position to really help the industry and really be close to projects that really help to curate the future of our industry from a person perspective and also from, you know, like an advocacy and a brand ambassador perspective. I think it's, it's, it's an amazing time um, to be here. Well, I can't wait to see what you do, what you achieve. I'm sure it'll be (laughs) stellar, definitely stellar. So I thank you so much for, for taking all this time with me and uh, for being on the show. And I can't wait to visit you in Amsterdam and have that drink. And you're based in London, correct? Yes. Well, I can't wait because this is literally a 45 minute flight. I can't wait to come to London and we'll have a drink together. There's so many bars that I can't, I can't wait to go and support. And we've been supporting as best we can, but to physically go into the space and, you know, have a drink from a bartender, um, you know, we're, this is my 20th year as a bartender this year and, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I think we've, we've all uh, chosen the right path and I, I just can't wait to see it's hard times right now, but I can't wait to see what what comes forward and what we have the opportunity to do uh, for the better to help to help rebuild our industry. I'm sure we will. Yes, definitely, definitely. together, 100. Really percent Thank you for having me. I really appreciate sure, it. Thank you so much. Great conversation. <laughs> I wasn't finished with Lauren yet. 
I had to get her advice for the home bartender, as well as her choice for the one bar and cocktail she is dreaming of right now. She gave a great answer. You know, I think rather than a place, it's actually a feeling. There is something about just being with people that is actually more important than uh, the place and and what you're drinking. Um, The social aspect of food and beverage and breaking bread together and spending time together is uh, the most important thing. And so I think wherever those people are, that's where I want to be. And I'll probably be drinking a Don Julio margarita with that. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> but but I, I think it's uh I think it's more important now than ever that we we fundamentally understand that um that hospitality has multiple branches and food and beverage are one of the branches from that discipline. And that being with people and investing in bars and bartenders and businesses and the planet, like it, it, all of these things together is what makes the richer experience. And, um, you know, I can't wait to go to Italy, to be honest. I can't wait to go back to Mexico. I can't wait uh, to go back to a lot of the places where I have, you know, my fondest memories, but I'll go wherever the people are, wherever they're happy. I know I've got, you know, thousands of bar stools waiting for me around the world whenever that day comes. I love that answer. That's a good (laughs) answer. It was amazing to get to know Lauren over these past two episodes. I'm so looking forward to that drink now. She leaves us with another of her incredible cocktail creations. This one, a homage to the highest snow peaks in the world. Our cocktail of the week is the third pole, referring to the Himalayas being the third largest body of snow on our planet after the Antarctic and Arctic areas. Add all of the following ingredients to a mixer. One and a half ounces of bullet bourbon, three quarters of an ounce of Chinar Amaro, three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice, one ounce of Chaga Chai tea syrup, and two dashes of Bittered Sling Kensington Aromatic Bitters. Add ice and shake, shake, shake. Then double strain over fresh cubes in a double rocks glass. Garnish with dehydrated lemon wheel on a wood pick standing up from the cocktail, which signifies the flag atop the mountain claiming your achievement. To make Lauren's Chaga Chai Tea Syrup and learn more about the story of the cocktail, you'll have to go to a lushlifemanual.com where you'll also find this recipe, more recipes, and all the cocktails of the week, as well as links to all the ingredients. Lauren's answer to the question of where she would like to drink right now, if she could pick any place, made me think of where I would drink again if I could. And that answer is where all of my friends are. My first step into Swift or the Connaught, or the East London Liquor Company, will be a day I will never forget. If you live for Lush Life, make sure you are giving back to the bars you love by donating or taking part in cocktail delivery where you live. Theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leads me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation. And always drink responsibly and wash your hands and stay safe. Next week, our guest has designed some of the most memorable cocktail menus in the world. She then moved to New York, where she worked for the Dead Rabbit, and now has created the newest of new drinks magazines. Until that time, bottoms up.